Section 22 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Chapter 22 The Greyhound. Ah, gallant snowball! What remains up Forden's banks or Flixton's plains of all thy strength, thy sinewy force, which rather flew than ran the course? Ah, what remains, save that thy breed may to their father's fame succeed, and when the prize appears in view, may prove that they are snowballs too? The perfection to which the greyhound has been brought by persevering care and attention to its breed distinguishes it alike for beauty, shape, and high spirit, while its habits are mild and gentle in the extreme. These dogs were brought to this great perfection by the late Lord Orford, Major Topham, and others. Snowball, perhaps one of the best greyhounds that ever ran, won four cups, couples, and upwards of thirty matches at Malton, and upon the walls of Yorkshire. In fact, no dog had any chance with him except his own blood. In the November Malton coursing meeting in 1799, a Scotch greyhound was produced, which had beat every opponent in Scotland. It was then brought to England, and challenged any dog in the kingdom. The challenge was accepted, and Snowball selected for the trial of speed. After a course of two miles, the match, upon which considerable sums were depending, was decided in his favor. Another dog, which belonged to Sir Henry Bate Dudley, won seventy-four successive matches without having been once beaten. Various have been the opinions upon the difference of speed between a well-bred greyhound and a racehorse, if opposed to each other. Wishes had been frequently indulged by the sporting world that some criterion could be adopted by which the superiority of speed could be fairly ascertained, when the following circumstance accidentally took place, and afforded some information upon what had been previously considered a matter of great uncertainty. In the month of December, some years ago, a match was to have been run over Doncaster Racecourse for one hundred guineas. But one of the horses having been drawn, a mare started alone, that by running the ground she might ensure the wager, when having run about one mile in the four, she was accompanied by a greyhound bitch, which joined her from the side of the course, and emulatively entering into the competition, continued to race with the mare for the other three miles, keeping nearly head and head, and affording an excellent treat to the field by the energetic exertions of each. At passing the distance post, five to four was betted in favor of the greyhound. When parallel with the stand, it was even betting, and any person might have taken his choice from five to ten. The mare, however, had the advantage by a head at the termination of the course. The courage and spirit of these dogs is very great, a greyhound ran a hare single-handed and raced her so hard that not having time to run through an opening at the bottom of some paling, she and the greyhound made a spring at the same moment at the top of the pales. The dog seized her at the instant she reached it, and in the momentary struggle he slipped between two broken pails, each of which ran into the top of his thighs. In this situation he hung till the horseman came up, when, to their great surprise, he had the hare fast in his mouth, which was taken from him before he could be released. I saw a hare coursed on the Brighton Downs some years ago by two celebrated greyhounds. Such was the length of the course, some of it up very steep hills, that the hare fell dead before the dogs, who were so exhausted that they only reached to within six feet of her. This was one of the severest courses ever witnessed. On another occasion two dogs ran a hare for several miles, 
and with such speed as to be very soon out of sight of the coursing party. After a considerable search, both the dogs and the hare were found dead within a few yards of each other, nor did it appear that the former had touched the hare. Mr. Daniel, in his rural sports, states that a brace of greyhounds in Lincolnshire ran a hare from her seat to where she was killed, a distance measuring straight of upwards of four miles, in twelve minutes. During the course there was a good number of turns, which must have very considerably increased the space gone over. The hare ran till she died before the greyhounds touched her. In the year 1798, a brace of greyhounds, the property of Mr. Cortall of Carlisle, coursed a hare from the swift near that city, and killed her at Clemmel, seven miles distant. Both greyhounds were so exhausted that unless the aid of medical men who happened to be on the spot had been immediately given, they would have died, and it was with difficulty they were recovered. In the year 1818, a black greyhound bitch, the property of Mr. John Heaton of Scarisbrick in Lancashire, left her master, forsook the habitation where she had been reared, betook herself to the fields and thickets, and adopted a life of unlimited freedom, defying all the restraints of man. In this state she killed a great number of hares for food, and occasionally made free with a sheep. She, therefore, very soon became a nuisance in the neighborhood. She had taken her station at the distance of two miles from her master's house, and was generally found near this spot. In consequence of her depredations, many attempts were made to shoot her, but in vain. She eluded for more than six months the vigilance of her pursuers. At length she was observed to go into a barn that stood in a field which she frequented. She entered the building through a hole in the wall, and by means of a rope snare was caught as she came out. On entering the barn, three whelps were found about a week old, so that in her savage state she had evidently been visited by a male of her own species. The whelps were, foolishly enough, immediately destroyed. As the bitch herself evinced the utmost ferocity, and though well secured, vainly attempted to seize every person that approached, she was taken home and treated with the greatest kindness. By degrees her ferocity abated, and in the course of two months she became perfectly reconciled to her original abode. The following season she ran several courses. There continued a wildness in her look, yet, although at perfect liberty, she did not attempt again to stray away, but seemed quite reconciled to her domestic life. Few facts can show the high courage of the greyhound more than the following. As a gamekeeper of Lord Egremont's was leading a brace of greyhounds in couples, a hare accidentally crossed the road in view. This temptation proved so irresistible that the dogs, by a joint effort, broke suddenly from their conductor and gave chase, shackled as they were together. When they got up and gave the hare the first turn, it was evidently much to her advantage, as the greyhounds were so embarrassed that it was with great difficulty they could change the direction. Notwithstanding this temporary delay, they sustained no diminution of natural energy, but continued the course through, and over various obstructions, till the object of their pursuit fell a victim to their invincible perseverance, after a run of between three and four miles. In addition to the beauty, elegance, high spirit, and speed of the greyhound, may be mentioned his mild and affectionate disposition, as well as his fidelity and attachment to those who treat him with kindness. They will also show sometimes considerable sagacity, of which the following is an instance. Two young gentlemen went to skate, attended only by a greyhound. About the time they were expected home, the dog arrived at the house full speed, and by his great anxiety, by laying hold of the clothes of some of the inmates, and by his significant gestures, he convinced them that something was wrong. They followed the greyhound and came to the pond. 
a hat was seen on the ice near which was a fresh aperture the bodies of the young gentlemen were soon found but life was extinct in this instance the sagacity of the dog was extraordinary had he possessed the power of speech he could scarcely have communicated what had taken place more significantly than he did i have received the following anecdote from a friend on whose veracity i can depend in the year eighteen sixteen a greyhound bitch in pup was sent from the neighbourhood of edinburgh by a carrier via dumfries to the neighbourhood of castle douglas in the stewartry of kirkudbright she brought up her litter of pups there and in the following year was returned by the same route to edinburgh from whence she was sent by way of douglas and muirkirk to the neighbourhood of cumnock in ayrshire after remaining there five or six months she found her way across the country to the house near castle douglas where she had brought up her pups the fact of her crossing the country was ascertained by shepherds who saw her accompanied by a pointer dog she arrived accompanied by this dog who left her almost immediately and found his way home again the bitch was bred in east lothian and had never been previously either in ayrshire or dumfrieshire a small italian greyhound in bologna which used at nights to have a kind of jacket put on to guard him from the cold went out generally very early in the morning to a neighbouring house to visit another dog of the same breed which lived there he always endeavoured by various coaxing gestures to prevail upon the people of the house to take off his night jacket in order that he might play more at ease with his companion it once happened when he could not get any one to do him this service that he found means by various contortions of his body rubbing himself against tables and chairs and working with his limbs to undress himself without any other assistance after this trial had succeeded he continued to practice it for some time until his master discovered it who after that undressed him every morning and let him out of the house at noon and in the evening he always returned home sometimes when he made his morning call he found the door of the house in which his friend dwelt not yet open in these cases he placed himself opposite to the house and by loud barking solicited admittance but as the noise which he made became troublesome both to the inhabitants of the house and to the neighbours they not only kept the door shut against him but endeavoured also to drive him away from the house by throwing stones at him from the windows he crept however so close to the door that he was perfectly secure against the stones and now they had to drive him away with a whip after some time the dog went again to the house and waited without barking till the door was opened he was again driven away upon which he discontinued his visits for a long time at length however he ventured to go once more to the house and set up a loud barking placing himself in a situation where he was both secure against the stones and could not be seized by the people of the house when they opened the door after a considerable time he one morning saw a boy come to the house lay hold of the knocker and strike it against the door and he observed that upon this process the door was opened after the boy had been let in the dog crept along the side of the house to the door and took his station upon the spot where the boy had stood when he knocked and where no one who stood close to the door could be seen from within here he leaped several times at the knocker till he raised it and made it strike the door a person from within immediately called who is there but receiving no answer opened the door upon which the dog ran in with tokens of great delight and soon found his way to his friend often after this he availed himself of the fortunate discovery which he had made and his ingenuity was so much admired that it procured him thenceforward free access to his companion's habitation while on the subject of greyhounds i cannot resist the insertion of the following account of one extracted from froissart 
when richard the second was confined in the castle of flint he possessed a greyhound which was so remarkably attached to him as not to notice or fawn upon any one else frossart says it was informed me king richard had a greyhound called matha who always waited upon the king and would know no one else for whenever the king did ride he that kept the greyhound did let him loose and he would straight run to the king and fawn upon him and leap with his four feet upon the king's shoulders and as the king and the earl of derby talked together in the court the greyhound who was wont to leap upon the king left the king and came to the earl of derby duke of lancaster and made to him the same friendly countenance and cheer he was wont to do the king the duke who knew not the greyhound demanded of the king what the greyhound would do cosin quoth the king it is a great good token to you and an evil sign to me sir how know ye that quoth the duke i know it well quoth the king the greyhound maketh you cheer this day as king of england as ye shall be and i shall be deposed the greyhound hath this knowledge naturally therefore take him to you he will follow you and forsake me the duke understood well those words and cherished the greyhound who would never after follow king richard but followed the duke of lancaster it is not however improbable that the dog thus mentioned was the irish wolf-dog as the fact related is more characteristic of that noble animal the mild affable and serene aspect of the greyhound constitutes no drawback to its innate sagacity or grateful attention to its protector of which the unfortunate king charles i was so observant that the remark he made during his troubles is on record and strictly just as applicable to the instinctive fidelity of the animal he said the greyhound possessed all the good nature of the spaniel without the fawning washington irving mentions that in the course of his reading he had fallen in with the following anecdote which illustrates in a remarkable manner the devoted attachment of these dogs to their masters an officer named saint leger who was imprisoned in vincennes near paris during the wars of saint bartholomew wished to keep with him a greyhound that he had brought up and which was much attached to him but they harshly refused him this innocent pleasure and sent away the greyhound to his house in the rue des lions saint paul the next day the greyhound returned alone to vincennes and began to bark under the windows of the tower where the officer was confined st leger approached looked through the bars and was delighted again to see his faithful hound who began to jump and play a thousand gambols to show her joy he threw a piece of bread to the animal who ate it with great good will and in spite of the immense wall which separated them they breakfasted together like two friends this friendly visit was not the last abandoned by his relations who believed him dead the unfortunate prisoner received the visits of his greyhound only during four years confinement whatever weather it might be in spite of rain or snow the faithful animal did not fail a single day to pay her accustomed visit six months after his release from prison st leger died the faithful greyhound would no longer remain in the house but on the day after the funeral returned to the castle of vincennes and it is supposed she was actuated by a motive of gratitude a jailer of the outer court had always shown great kindness to this dog which was as handsome as affectionate contrary to the custom of people of that class this man had been touched by her attachment and beauty so that he facilitated her approach to see her master and also ensured her a safe retreat penetrated with gratitude for this service the greyhound remained the rest of her life near the benevolent jailer it was remarked that even while testifying her zeal and gratitude for her second master one could easily see that her heart was with the first 
like those who, having lost a parent, a brother, or a friend, come from afar to seek consolation by viewing the place which they inhabited. This affectionate animal repaired frequently to the tower where St. Leger had been imprisoned, and would contemplate for hours together the gloomy window from which her dear master had so often smiled to her, and where they had so frequently breakfasted together. The natural simplicity and peaceable demeanor of the greyhound may have sometimes induced a doubt of its possessing the sagacity, fidelity, and attachment of other dogs. But when he is kindly treated and domesticated, he is capable of showing them to an equal degree with any of the canine race. Some of the best coursing in England takes place on the Wiltshire Downs, where it is no uncommon sight to see a hare run away from two good dogs without a single turn. Nearly three hundred years ago, Sir Philip Sidney referred to this sport on the Wiltshire Downs in one of his poems, in which he remarks, So on the downs we see, near Wilton Fair, a hastened hare from greedy greyhounds go. The following account of the Persian Greyhound appeared in the Book of Sports. The Persian Greyhound is much esteemed in its native country, where the nobles, who are excessively fond of the chase, keep a great number of them at a considerable expense, the best and most favored dogs frequently having their collars and housings covered with precious stones and embroidery. These greyhounds are employed in coursing hares in the plains and in chasing the antelope. As the speed of the antelope is greater than that of the greyhound, the Persians train hawks for the purpose of assisting the dog in this kind of chase. The hawks, when young, are fed upon the head of a stuffed antelope, and thus taught to fly at that part of the animal. When the antelope is discovered, the hawk is cast off, which, fastening its talons in the animal's head, impedes its progress, and thus enables the greyhounds to overtake it. The chase, however, in which the Persians chiefly delight, and for which those greyhounds are most highly valued, is that of the goo cur, or wild ass. This animal, which generally inhabits the mountainous districts, is extremely shy and of great endurance and is considered by the Persians as one of the swiftest of all quadrupeds. These qualities, and the nature of the ground over which it is usually chased, render the capture of the wild ass very uncertain, and its pursuit extremely hazardous to the sportsman. When the Persians go out to hunt the wild ass, Relays of greyhounds are placed at various distances in the surrounding country, in such directions as are most likely to be traversed by the object of pursuit, so that when one relay is tired, there is another fresh to continue the chase. Such, however, is the speed and endurance of the goo cur, that it is seldom fairly run down by the greyhounds, its death generally being achieved by the rifle of some lucky horseman. The Persians evince great skill and courage in this arduous sport, riding, rifle in hand, up and down precipitous hills, over stony paths, and across ravines and mountain streams, which might well daunt our boldest turf-skimming Meltonians. Though several Persian greyhounds have at different times been brought to this country, the breed can scarcely be considered as established here. The specimen, however, a female, from which Mr. Hamilton painted the picture from which our engraving is taken, was bred in this country. She was then supposed to be the only Persian greyhound bitch in England. The Persian greyhound is very handsome. One of the finest species of dog I have ever seen, says an interesting writer, is a sort of greyhound which the Persians rear to assist them in the chase. They have generally long silken hair upon their quarters, shoulders, ears, and tail, and I think them as handsome and considerably more powerful and sagacious than our own greyhounds. I have sometimes seen a spirited horse break loose and run away at full speed, when one of these dogs has set after him like an arrow, and soon getting ahead of him, taken an opportunity of seizing the bridle in his teeth, 
which he held so firmly that though he was not strong enough to stop the horse, yet, as he was dragged along, he continued to pull and confine the horse so as to impede him very much, till some person was able to overtake and secure him. Colonel Hutchinson says that in Persia and many parts of the East, greyhounds are taught to assist the falcon in the capture of deer. When brought within good view of a herd, the bird is flown, and at the same moment the dog is slipped. The rapid sweep of the falcon soon carries him far in advance. It is the falcon who makes the selection of the intended victim, which appears to be a matter of chance. And a properly trained greyhound will give chase to none other, however temptingly close the alarmed animals may pass him. The falcon is instructed to aim at the head only of the gazelle who soon becomes bewildered. Sometimes receiving considerable injury from the quick stroke of its daring adversary. Before long the gazelle is overtaken by the greyhound. It is not always easy to teach a dog to avoid injuring the bird, which is so intent upon its prey as utterly to disregard the approach of the hound. Death would probably be the penalty adjudged to him for so heinous an offence, for a well-trained falcon is of great value. You can readily imagine that neither it nor the greyhound could be properly broken unless the instructor possessed much judgment and perseverance. The sport is very exciting, but the spectator must be well mounted and ride boldly, who would closely watch the swift, varying evolutions of the assailing party and the sudden evasions of the helpless defendant. End of chapter 22 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon